everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's presentation, Boots on the Ground, Support for COVID-19 Infection Prevention and Control, which is being presented by Dr. Buffy Lloyd Preci. Um, Dr. Buffy has always had a passion for mitigating infectious diseases through a data-driven approach. Even before the pandemic, Buffy realized how serious infections impact the long-term care population. Drawn to action to improve the infection prevention landscape, she founded her company, IPC Well, to keep residents and healthcare workers safe. Buffy took a boots on the ground approach with facilities across the nation, doing in-person deep dive assessments to offer immediate support to healthcare workers on the front lines. She has led teams with Doctors Without Borders into hard hit areas and travels the country to long-term care facilities to assess, train, and educate with an un unmatched vehemence and energy. When she is not on site, she is participating in and offering her expertise to other national projects, such as Project ECHO, a hub and spoke knowledge sharing network in which she leads virtual clinics on infection, infection control epic, the energy or emergency preparedness infection control disaster program offered to all Arizona skilled nursing centers and the CDC White House vaccination forum. Her many credentials include 20 years experience in successfully developing and implementing healthcare and public health programs. She is CIC board certified in infection prevention and control. In 2019, she was the chapter president for the Arizona APIC Association. She also was a chair for the CDF Foundation Long-Term Care Committee. She is also a doctor, has a doctorate in public health epidemiology, a master's in biomedical informatics, and a bachelor of science degree, degree in applied mathematics. So with that, Superior Health welcomes you to today's presentation, and I will turn it over to you, Buffy. Hey, so good to be here today. Um, I just, Tracy, do we have the slide deck up or do I need to pull mine up? I can certainly pull it up. That's not a problem. Hang on just Thanks. a second. Thanks everybody for joining today. It's truly an honor to be with you. And everyone should feel free to enter questions into the chat. throughout the presentation. And I will share my screen. Thanks, Tracy. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> It's always, I'm going to call it Technical Tuesday. We have some challenges today, and it's my fault. So, um, anyway, again, happy to be here with you today. We're going to describe today this infection prevention and control assessment um, that I have been providing on site boots on the ground support, as Tracy indica indicated, across the country, and more specifically within the superior health quality improvement organization, I have had the absolute privilege of coming on site to over 20 facilities within Superior Health, or I believe maybe right at 20 facilities. And what we have, um, and so I'm going to bring these practices to you today. I'm going to describe what this on-site infection prevention and control on-site assessment actually looks like so that perhaps even today you can take this information and apply it to your own facility that can support you in your infection control program. We're going to be exploring the various IPC domains that are evaluated during this boots on the ground assessment and also review local state and national IPC best practices. Next slide, please. 
So one thing that I always tell the facilities when I come on site is it's not Buffy's opinion or the rules I'm making up. Everything that I am going to recommend today is based on your local state or national evidence-based practices. So really uh, just a little bit about myself. They do call me Dr. Buffy, the COVID slayer. I believe it was my friends at Doctors Without Borders that coined this phrase. I'm not sure how much I love it, but it's definitely easier to say than Lloyd Krejci. So we'll just stick to um, Dr. Buffy, that's fine. Um, I did have the opportunity as Tracy so kindly described was being able to really uh, implement infection control practices across the state and um, in the really the hard hit area. So this is just a couple. Um, this um, original picture here was actually in Detroit, Michigan, where I worked with Doctors Without Borders, really helping to 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 um, to provide the guidance and direction for their infection control program, supporting uh, boots on the ground in in the hard hit areas. We really were some of the first people that came on site. And um, we just saw such a great need. And then, you know, since then, I've really taken the program across the country and, and again, fortunate enough to be able to provide that support to some of your facilities. Next slide, please. So along with the actual on-site assessment, perhaps one of the most valuable resources that I hear from facilities is the detailed assessment report. When I come on site to a facility, I actually take pictures and it takes me a minute. Um, you know, it can be a little scary, like, oh my gosh, she's taking pictures. Um, but actually it's for this on-site assessment report. It really helps connect the pieces together. When I first started doing assessments, I didn't take pictures and, and um, I found that the facilities weren't really reading through the report. And when I started adding the pictures of the best practices, as well as the gaps, the facility feedback was that they were able to really understand what, what I saw through my eyes and then able to take action to implement some of the best practices. So this definitely helps. This detailed assessment report includes all the different domains such as the facility entrance, the employee check-in, um, hand hygiene, and basically all of the areas we're going to cover today are, are what, was, um, what has been included in this assessment report, including the recommendations from CDC and CMS and um, this, this regulating bodies. Next slide, please. So the first area that I always look at, of course, when I'm coming up to a facility is the facility entrance. Next slide. This is really where we are the gatekeepers to our facilities. We want to ensure that we are making sure that nobody's coming into the facility that may be symptomatic. And really this was our first tool to being able to keep COVID out of our facility as much as possible through this symptomatic check. So the first thing I look for, and you know, everything that I'm suggesting today, you can actually go through your facility and do exactly the same thing. So first thing I do is, you know, as I'm walking up to a facility is actually look to see if there's appropriate signage on the door. Is there, does it actually state the information about COVID-19? Um, is the door locked? Am I, am I able to actually open it? I've had buildings that were locked, but then because of the traffic coming in, somebody could easily let me in. So ensuring that there is a locked door, um, his, his reinforces that systematic checking of everybody coming into the facility. And, and speaking today, it's, it's even more relevant as we are reopening to visitors. And this may be really important as you are able to screen everybody coming in and making sure that you continue to keep your building safe and reduce the risk of having COVID in your facility. Next slide, please. Now, the next section that we that I look for is that employee check-in. Um, this is really, again, critical to the operation and to having people in your, your facility. Uh, you want to ensure that there is appropriate hand sanitizer, that the screening protocol is the screen, screening questionnaire is available, and that if possible, if you're using, um, you're having staff use different pens, having that clean pen and the dirty pen so that the facility can actually um, sanitize the and not share um, any potential pens with, with each other. 
Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and you can just scroll through this, Tracy, for me. What's really important with the the screening process is ensuring this is from the CMS targeted survey that instructs that we make sure that everybody coming into our facility that we actually instruct them to perform hand hygiene. This is probably one of the most common areas that I found deficient in was that you have hand sanitizer there, but there was no instruction to actually perform hand hygiene. And this is one area that I have often seen facilities receive citations for from their state and federal surveyors is because they're not actually instructing visitors to um, conduct hand hygiene. In addition, you want to ensure that you are providing instructions that the, the visitors stay six feet apart, that they're wearing the mask. It's also important to ask them actually what their protocol is, especially right now. This is something I'm specifically doing more and more is asking, what are your PPE protocols? What is the mask requirement? What is the eye protection requirement? Are you requiring everybody in your building to wear a surgical mask or an N95 mask? What about eye protection? Do I need to put my face shield on or goggles or am I okay not to? And as somebody who comes into buildings, I don't know what your policies and procedures are. So it's really important that, that, that you have somebody or some way of instructing your visitors that are coming into the building what your specific protocols are. And this is going to help keep your facility safe and again, reduce the risk of bringing COVID into your facility. Next slide, please. Hand hygiene is definitely an opportunity that I look at everywhere that I go. It is probably still the number one area that I see that has challenges with, and most of that is due to access. Many facilities will have hand sanitizers inside of the resident rooms, but not necessarily outside of the resident rooms. Next slide. The CDC does recommend that you have hand sanitizer dispensers inside every room and if possible outside of every resident room. This is to increase compliance and additionally that you have it's the 60 to 95 percent alcohol. Um, unless your hands are visibly soiled, alcohol-based hand rub or ABHR is actually the preferred method of hand hygiene within this healthcare setting. Um, unless, and then there's other certain clinical situations, such as if the resident has C. diff, we would want to wash with soap and water. Um, another area that you may not think about, but is really a target for our, our surveys, is ensuring that we're offering the residents hand sanitizer before they eat their meals and after using the restroom. So a simple way that you can do this is there are um, like little packets of, of cloths that you can put on trays and this can help ensuring that the residents have the opportunity to conduct hand hygiene. The residents are not required to conduct hand hygiene, we can't force them to, but it is our requirement to offer them hand hygiene opportunities. Um, I actually was just on one of my echo calls this morning and we were, we learned that they believe that some of their residents may, uh, one of the facilities had commented that they believe that one of their outbreaks came from a few of their residents that maybe didn't conduct hand hygiene because um, they were more um, touching different things in the facility and all, and a few of them had, had gotten COVID. So it is important to remember the residents as we're, we're conducting hand hygiene. And in addition, when I often go into a facility, if I see that there are hand sanitizers inside of the room, and then maybe one or two in the hallway, I, I really will ask the staff, how are you actually doing hand hygiene? It's, there's really not, um, it's not really, having accessible sanitizers there for me. For example, someone like me, I'm not necessarily gonna to wanna to reach inside of a resident room to get hand sanitizer. So having them spaced nicely outside of the rooms is really important too. And one of the main areas that I hear frequently is that it's against the fire code or the fire marshal has, has indicated that we're not allowed to do that. 
And I would encourage you that if you've actually never checked with your fire marshal, that you would consider actually following up with the fire marshal to determine what criteria you need in order to safely install hand sanitizing dispensers at inside and outside of your resident rooms. There, there is, you will never have too much based on the amount that the sanitizing dispensers hold, you will most likely never have more than the requirement um, for to meet the fire codes. So I know that this has been a longstanding historically issue. And so I encourage you to reach out to your fire marshal and identify what the current protocols are. Next slide. And then you can go through the different bullet points. There, there is a different, there is a difference between hand washing and hand sanitizing. And as I said, hand sanitizer is the preferred method for washing hands in most clinical situations. And consider having the hand sanitizer in the resident rooms and in the hallways. These are some great posters that you can you can display. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure how how much the staff will sit and watch it and um, and actually receive these instructions, but this could be a great tool for you to do as an in-service training. Uh, one technique that I like to do for staff is to actually have some gloves on and have a couple volunteers come up during an in-service training and put paint on my gloves and then um, rub the paint in on the gloves and then have the staff remove or doff the gloves. And, and, it, and it's a good practice because we can see when we have the paint on our hands, um, just even, even removing some of the, the gloves, you can see the paint can get on um, some of the arms and, and just the importance of how hand hygiene is so critical um, in all of these different scenarios. Next slide, please. So we talk a lot about the different moments of hand hygiene. Um, this is what a lot of people will focus on. If you really think about it, I encourage you, I mean, this is a lot. And so I encourage you to go out on your hallways even today and just take a peek out and see how well the staff are doing putting um, doing hand hygiene. I typically don't see it being a uh, hand sanitizer being used before gloves are put on. So this may be an area of opportunity. We want to ensure that before and after every contact with residents that we actually use hand sanitizer. And this includes before putting on gloves. Of course, before performing any aseptic task or technique, after contact with any blood or bodily fluids, uh, after removing that PPE, after using the restroom and before meals. Um, again, that exercise with the paint on the gloves can be a really good, good practice that can help demonstrate effective hand hygiene and even removing a doffing of your PPE. Next slide, please. Uh, shared resident equipment. So I learned a lot from, from you guys over this last winter as far as some of the practices that you are using for shared resident equipment. We want to ensure that the staff have easy access to the cleaning agent in order to appropriately clean and disinfect the shared resident equipment. You can see this picture on the left has these these bags that are hanging off of the, um, the Hoyer lift, and you can actually nicely place a cavi wipe container as well as gloves in there so that it's easily accessible. It's at the point of care. And in addition, you can do the same for the, the vitals, cards, and machines. This really helps the staff a lot. It's, it's really just a challenge if you don't have access to it. Um, to ensure that it's getting done properly. Next slide. So we do want to ensure that all of the shared resident equipment is being cleaned and disinfected in between every resident use. Um, and that includes your Hoyer lift, your blood pressure cuffs, any of your vitals, machine, your vitals equipment. You can see this picture on the left. This was um, some signage and instruction that I created for one of my facilities um, that I'm that was to provide instructions to the staff because for some reason anytime I come on site um, the the staff would like the cavi wipes would disappear everything would just 
up here. So it's just a good strategy to actually create the checklist or create the instructions with pictures from your facility of what those steps are and then laminate it. I know how much you guys love laminators. I do too. And then, um, and then you can attach it to your Hoyer lifts or your vitals cards. That's just a really nice visual for the staff and remind a reminder of what they're uh, meant to do. One of the facility, um, it, these facilities, like I said, they have the different bags that I learned this from you guys, which is so great because then everything you need is right there. You just want to make sure you have a process for cleaning that actual bag, um, whether it's daily or shift, per shift, because obviously we're touching it. And so we want to make sure that it's being cleaned properly as well. Um, another area that you can do is you see that you see hand sanitizer on the wall. And if your bags that you're attaching to your vitals cards or shared equipment, if it does, if it's not large enough for gloves, you can hang these gloves outside of the room um, in front of or it, on top of the dispensers. And this gives easy access. I'm all about easy access and keeping things really simple because we know our staff are running 100 miles per hour and and they're not it's not convenient for them to have to stop what they're doing and going and looking for these cleaning agents. And we also want to always promote them to use the gloves when they're touching the cavi wipes or any of these satiny wipes because the chemicals are so strong. So ensuring that you couple the cleaning agent with gloves is really important because this will prompt the staff to wear gloves and protect themselves. Next slide, please. Let's talk briefly about the transitional care unit. Um, next slide. This is probably one of the hardest units to have compliance with infection control. Uh, I, it's, it's very challenging. And first of all, I want to have some good news for you. CDC came out on March the 10th with some guidance that states that if we have fully vaccinated residents, and then, and their new admissions, and they've not been exposed to COVID, then they do not have to be placed on a 14 day quarantine. Now, please check with your county and state health departments to see if they have updated their guidance to meet this recommendation. I live in the state of Arizona and our state health department just updated it yesterday. And so this can be potentially good news for our facilities because then if you're fully vaccinated or you've had COVID, then we don't have to keep our residents on that 14 day quarantine. For the residents that don't meet that requirement, it's really important, of course, that we're keeping them protected um, and then we're keeping our environment protected. This is why we have this unit, this transitional unit, a quarantine unit, um, but it is very challenging to adhere to appropriate infection control measures because of the constant need to change and don and doff PPE in and out of every room. So let's keep it really simple. The things I look for when I, co I come on site is first I look for the signage. You want to ensure that you have this special droplet contact precaution precaution signage on every single resident room door. And this is really critically important, especially now as we're admitting more residents. I've seen some facilities, their occupancy is now getting um, decreasing as far as their open beds. And so some residents are having to stay longer on this unit, even if they are no longer on the 14 day quarantine. And so it's important that the staff who are going in and out of these rooms understand who's on transmission-based precautions and who's not. In addition, just a little tip, we don't wanna use this signage for other transmission-based precautions such as C. diff, MRSA, influenza. We wanna use the right signage for those particular infections. Uh, and I've seen that occur where we're now using this one particular sign for everybody and it's not necessarily applicable. So uh, again, we wanna ensure we have the proper signage if at all possible, we want to ensure that the doors are kept closed. I know that this is really a challenge and it can be a challenge for our residents. If it's not possible for your residents because they're a fall risk or it could potentially create harm to the resident, just be sure that you're documenting this in their, um, in their care plan. And this will help to ensure that you understand that it's appropriate and that it's um, a priority to keep the door closed, but it's, it could potentially create a risk for the resident 
And so if that's the case, just make sure you have that well documented. In addition, you want to ensure that the PPE is available, that they, you have bins outside or at least um, very easy, easily accessible PPE to for that room. Again, you want to ensure that it's it's easy in there. It's very challenging if you need to get into a room quickly and there's no PPE. And you want to have a, I look for a trash receptacle inside the room as well as a linen bin for all that PPE to be doffed inside of the room. Um, and then hand hygiene can also be available. The other process you want to ensure that you're doing is cleaning and disinfecting that face shield or goggles if you are reusing them after leaving the resident room. Again, we don't know what their COVID status is, and so we have to assume that perhaps they do have COVID. And if we're going from another room, we want to ensure that we're cleaning and disinfecting that face shield. Next slide, please. Here's some great signage. I've seen this all over every building. I don't know of any building I've been into that doesn't have it, but of course I wanna provide it to you because it helps to provide instructions. One thing you may consider is actually taking this, this donning and doffing process from the CDC and minimizing it and even laminating it for your housekeeping staff. Consider putting it on your housekeeping cards. I often find that our housekeeping department has um, probably the biggest challenge in adhering to our, our donning and doffing process. They don't necessarily have the training as some of our other departments. And this may be, and there's, and there's also high turnover too at times. And so this be a great tool that can be easily accessible um, and a good visual aid for all of our staff, but it can be helpful for the housekeeping staff as well, because we want to ensure that they have a process and understand proper donning and doffing techniques as well. Next slide. In, in addition, we want to ensure that we have the N95 respirators. It is a CDC guidance that recommends using N95 respirators for our transitional units that is stated on the CDC. Um, and that if you are having to reuse them, that you have a supply of new masks that they're stored in paper bags. I'm not seeing this as much. It seems the supply chain has increased. So most folks are not having to reuse the N95s as much past the five uses anyway. Um, the CDC recommendation is five uses and then to discard if you're still operating under the optimization plan. Again, you want to have the resident doors closed and having that PPE easily available and accessible. Um, you can also have, you know, the cleaning agents there available as well as hand sanitizer and just ensuring that every, every room has what they need. Next slide. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this except to say that we have all become great experts at at our processes. Uh, as you are well aware and you've experienced throughout this entire pandemic, our processes can change daily, our guidance. And so this can be very confusing for the staff. I'll just tell a quick little story. Uh, I was in a facility that, that needed some support creating um, and an cleaning the face shield process. And so we created this, we had instructions. And um, this is a facility that I went into frequently uh, I came in one day during shift change to see how the staff were cleaning it. And I observed about 10 different staff and every one of them had their own process and they were, none of them were doing it correctly. And this just showed me that sometimes just putting the instructional sheet there isn't enough. And so we, it's, it's important to have it there, but it's also very important to have in-person training and in services uh, that can really describe the process. And this can help the staff understand how to appropriately do something new. We have never reused our PPE before in a situation like this. And so cleaning a face shield, you think is easy, but it's not. It's like 10 steps to it or more. And so understanding that the staff need that in-person training that is very helpful in, in providing these new processes or these, these things that have more steps to achieve the desired result. Next slide. Uh, reusing PPE, we, we do have that occurring still, like I said, mostly with the face shields and 95 masks. 
gowns are not being reused as frequently, but I am seeing them being used. So what I look for when I come onto a facility is if the PPE is being reused, how is it being stored? We want to ensure that it's being stored in a safe manner, not to contaminate the healthcare workers. I've heard of many staff actually getting sick from COVID and possibly from reusing PPE. And so for example, this picture on the left where we have kind of our PPE shoved in back bags um, or maybe even touching. We don't want to do that. If, if you are still reusing PPE, consider making sure to have them hung on hooks that are separated. They're not touching uh, each other. And then also consider when you're hanging them up, hang them up inside out so the dirty side is facing the door. Um, and this will, so, and to put that in context, I always tell people the way you hang up a, a coat is you just hang it up um, you would actually hang it up the opposite way you would hang a coat. Um, and that way, you, when you go to put your arms in it, you're going into the clean area, not touching the dirty area and potentially contaminating yourself. Um, as far as face masks, again, the N95 respirators, if you are storing them in a brown paper bag, I'm not seeing this as much anymore, which is good news, but my recommendation is to conduct that good hand hygiene before and after touching it because we want to assume the outside is dirty from the, the environment. And so touching it, we want it, we want to make sure we're using hand sanitizer. Next slide, please. A storing of the face shields, and you can go through the, the list there. Storing of the face shields, here's just a couple samples of what I've seen in facilities where each person, each staff member has a bin. This is helpful. And then even having the cleaning agent uh, available there. You can see the middle slide on the table. There's actually laminated instructions on how to clean and disinfect the face shield. The cleaning agent is there available to clean the face shield as well as gloves. And this just provides everything in one location. Some facilities don't have this, this uh, the luxury of having a actual location. And so identifying your facility, maybe you have to store your face shields in each department, um, but you the key to it is storing the face shield in a clean area so that it's not being contaminated. Uh, I would love to hear in the chat if anybody is not reusing the eye protection anymore. That would be really interesting to learn. Um, and again, you can store them in brown paper bags as well. So these are the things I look for as far as, as far as eye protection. If you're doing this type of assessment for your facility, I encourage you to look in, if you don't have a designated area to store the face shields, then consider going into the different departments and identifying how their face shields, how their PPE is being stored and ensuring that it's in a, a clean area that's not going to potentially contaminate the staff. Next slide, please. Our COVID units are definitely in a whole group of their own. Many of the principles that apply for the quarantine or observation unit will also apply for a COVID unit. We want to ensure there is proper signage, that there's a proper barrier, uh, that the food carts and any linen is, is being transported. Um, perhaps in a separate entry, these are all very helpful ways to keep that unit very separate as much as possible from the rest of the facility. Next slide. So what I'm looking for in the COVID unit typically is an entrance or an ante room where you have clean PPE that you can dawn before you enter into the, the COVID unit. One common practice that I've seen that is that staff will put on gloves before they even go into the COVID unit. And this is actually not a CDC recommendation. You actually will put your, make sure you have your gown on, your face mask, N95, as well as your eye protection but you don't want to put gloves on when you enter the COVID unit because then you're not conducting hand hygiene. We never wear gloves outside of our patient care unless we are going to be coming into contact with something that potentially would, that needs the gloves on. But 
um, consider having signage as indicated here. So this picture on the left has the table, has some PPE available, and it just had like a handwritten note. And we actually went further and created some typed signage with their pictures that were easy to follow and easy to understand and basically saying perform hand hygiene, put on your gown, your mask, your goggles, and then you can enter the unit. We wanna make it very simple. This, these steps can apply to any area in your facility. It's not just the COVID unit, but this definitely helps, especially the staff that do not work in your facility all the time. And I look at myself as an example, I'm coming into buildings as a new, new set of eyes and how, how well are the instructions so that somebody that's brand new coming in can follow your protocols and keep your staff and keep your residents free from infection. I've seen hospice workers coming in that have done um, incorrectly. I've seen respiratory therapists that have come in and haven't known really what to do. And so you have to consider that even though your staff may have in, been in service and may have a good understanding, what about agency nurses? What about people that don't typically work in your facility all the time? So we have to consider that and just consider how that would be for them walking in. And so for me coming in as an outsider, those are the things that I look for. Um, really well described instructions that are gonna keep me safe and keep you safe. Next slide, please. Again, for the exit, this was the sign on the left saying, thank you for visiting, which I thought was kind of cute. Open the zipper, um, throw away your gloves, throw away your gown. And, and then, you know, follow this process. Again, we created this nice signage. What, what I learned from this process was I actually helped create the signage and I posted it on the actual barrier. And then when I went to walk through the process, I realized it didn't make sense because I was instructing and we were instructing to remove the mask, the shield, and throw everything away and then go out. And when we realized that, well, we can't do that because we need to keep ourselves safe. We need to wear eye protection. We need to wear a face mask or the N95 mask until we leave. So it's, it's really important if you're the one creating the signage that you walk through the steps that your staff are going to walk through and ensure that it actually is able to be implemented to keep them safe. It's um, definitely a good practice to do that and ensuring that our process is effective. Next slide. So environmental cleaning, this is perhaps one of my biggest passions. I never thought coming into infection control that my biggest passion would be environmental cleaning. However, I have seen that it is probably the most undereducated in this healthcare setting. And really these are housekeepers are so dedicated and do um, just, they're in every single room, they're all over the building. And we really need to dedicate more time to providing them support and training. Next slide. So when I come on site in a facility, I will spend time look, talking to the housekeepers if they're available. Sometimes this isn't always possible based on the time of day I come in. Um, but if so, the, the things that I'm looking for is the process, that the order does matter, that we wanna clean from the cleanest to the dirtiest to high to low. Uh, in a clockwise manner or counterclockwise and understanding what our dwell time or contact time is how long is how long does the chemical need to stay on the surface in order to kill the microorganisms. Um, unfortunately, when I'm talking to staff, probably about 90% of the time I, I get that they're cleaning the restroom first um, and that they only change the gloves when they're done cleaning the room. And what this tells me is if they're cleaning the restroom first and then they're cleaning the resident room, it means they're not changing their gloves after cleaning the toilet. And with those same gloves, they're cleaning this tray table where the residents eat. And you know, so it's, it's in developing the relationships and having the conversations with our staff to help us understand their process. And then, you know, learning, well, why do you do that? Well, I, I hear because the restrooms, the furthest away, so they're going to do that room first, or it's the dirtiest, so they want to clean it first. Um, and so we want to understand the why. 
and then helping to bring education as to the correct process so that they can quickly remediate that and begin to clean in a way that doesn't potentially cross-contaminate the environment. Next slide. So this is, um, this is actually a picture that was taken when I was working with Doctors Without Borders in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, this is Miss Phyllis who gave us permission to, to show her picture. And I just adore Miss Phyllis. And we spent a lot of time together actually. Uh, I actually probably came on site here about seven or eight times and we spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with education with the housekeeping staff. I'm going to just be very frank with you and, and writing up your policies and practices and putting them in a book and telling your housekeeping staff to, to read the book. It's not gonna work, it just doesn't. We have to spend time with our staff. We you know, get in there with them, demonstrate for them, demonstrate how to properly clean the environment from cleanest to dirtiest, um, how to actually use the chemicals so that they are actually staying on the surface for the right amount of time, um, how to don and dock PPE and to keep themselves safe and really demonstrating to them their value. This is so critical to, to letting them know how valuable they are to infection control that without them, without environmental services, our entire operations would be shut down. We cannot operate in an unsanitary environment. And so we really need to dedicate that time to our environmental services. Next slide. And so here's just a couple examples that you can take a look out for within your facility. First, with the, the environmental cleaning cart, you can see here that there is a pair of eye goggles next to the toilet bowl brush, um, very dirty water, disorganized cart to the left. So we want to take a look at this. You can go in your facility today and just take a look at your, your environmental cleaning cart and just see, is it well organized? Is it potentially going to cause uh, potential cross-contamination for your housekeeping staff. Do they have the supplies that they need? Uh, then this trolley cart on the right, I always tell people it looks well organized, but don't let it fool you. Uh, I do believe this cart actually had food and drinks inside of it that the, the housekeeping staff were using as snacks. So we don't want to keep food or water, anything on our carts. We want to ensure that, that we have the bags that can contain soiled linen, soiled trash, um, and that everything is well organized. We want to, you know, if you think about being in every single room, I have seen outbreaks of C. diff and norovirus prior to the pandemic occur based on environmental services. And so we want to really ensure that these practices are implemented thoroughly. Next slide, please. Um, and so when we talk about cleaning and disinfectant products, we want to ensure that we have the appropriate products. And about 50% of the facilities that I go on have about both. They have EPA registered, some are EPA registered, some are not. When I come on site, I always take pictures of all the chemicals and look them up to see if they're EPA registered, as well as, as they're, if they're on the SARS-CoV-2 end list. And again, about 50% have about both. And so we want to ensure that our cleaning products are effective. They are EPA registered. That is a federal regulation. And so we want to make sure that we're using the appropriate chemicals. In addition, we want to really pay attention to that contact dwell time. This example on the right demonstrates how you can soak your towels and you can also soak your mops in this chemical or the, the cleaning agent. And this will ensure that the fibers actually soak up the chemical and then it will as you are cleaning the surface it will help to keep it wet longer and penetrate that surface and you know do you have a one minute dwell time 10 minutes clearly if you have 10 minutes it's going to be much harder to keep a surface wet for 10 minutes but this is one strategy to actually helping um, ensure that it the chemicals stay on it longer it is uh, many facilities are still using spray bottles. Um, it is, there is recommendation that we don't use spray bottles uh, through for our cleaning agents, but that we use um, more of the wipes because of just the aerosol aerosolization of the chemicals with the spray bottles. There's 
so much to learn about housekeeping. I actually just did a three-day infection control course on it. So um, just knowing the critical importance of it. Next slide. And when, when I go and, and look at laundry, um, again, I'm looking always for the opportunity. Is there cross-contamination possible for the healthcare worker? I, I want to keep our residents safe. And just as importantly, I want to keep our staff safe and free from harm. And so in the laundry, I'm looking at, is there a clean, clear and distinct process for our soil and clean? Next slide, please. And so I come in and I'll look to ensure that um, the, the proper soil linen are in one area. Um, do the staff have proper PPE? I cannot tell you, this is probably one of the most significant areas I see in laundry. If you are using a gown and that it's hanging up, so today, you know, you can go in your in your laundry room. I know I've said you can go today a lot, so maybe tomorrow. <laughs> um, but you can see if the staff are reusing a gown to actually uh, reuse the um, the the PPE, and we don't want to reuse our PPE for our linen. If you think about it, our staff, our linen attendants, they're sorting out all of the soiled linen, it's potentially contaminating a gown, and then they're hanging it up, and when they go to pick it up again and use it, then they're touching the outside of it and they can contaminate themselves. So make sure that there's clean, available PPE available for the staff. Um, if you're using a launderable gown, they can just throw it right in there with the washing, with the wash and wash it right away. So definitely encourage you to have clean, available PPE. Um, that you have proper hand sanitizing available, whether it's through a sink and, you know, the sink and um, the water and soap and having paper towels available. In addition, the temperature, we want to look at the temperatures. I always ask what the temperature is. CDC and CMS are, are um, they recommend having that temperature of at least 160 degrees for a minimum of 25 minutes, uh, which is to effectively kill the microorganisms as well as having the appropriate dry time, which is about 170 to 190 degrees. Um, check with your, your environmental services supervisor to see what your temperatures actually reach. I actually had a, a, a linen attendant tell me um, that their washing machine temperature ran hot in the morning, but then by afternoon it ran cold. And so they needed actually a new water heater. And, um, and so it's important to, to talk to your staff so that they know exactly what um, the temperatures are and learn from them because they're going to, they're going to tell you everything that's going on in their facility if they have a leak, um, you know, or anything going on within the laundry area. Next slide, please. Um, actually, Tracy, if you could just go back, I wanted to mention a couple more things about the laundry too. One other thing is making sure that you have your vendor, um, that your vendor is coming in monthly to check your laundry services as well as your food services. So whatever vendor you have that supplies your chemicals, this is really important because they're going to check your dispensers that, att for, that attach to your, your washing machine. And those tubing, they can get clogged, they can, the, um, they can break, and it's important that your vendors are coming in and servicing your equipment. In addition, if you're using a formulary, such as if you use, say, formulary one is for isolation, two is for resident clothes, and so forth, then the, the vendor actually is, um, he, they're the ones that are, are um, sorry, I can't think of the word. <laughs> They're the ones that are calculating that with your washing machine and the formulary to make sure that it's working. If And this is really important because they know what the different formularies are. And we want to make sure that they're, um, that they're in proper order. If your answer to how often the vendor is coming in is if we need them, then I would recommend that you 
um, that you use it, <laughs> that you don't do that because that means you're waiting for something to break. And we want to be proactive and not reactive. And so having them on a routine schedule is very common. And typically, like I said, they should be coming in monthly. So find out from your, your supervisors how often your vendors are coming in. Next slide. Similarly to the laundry services, I will look in food services. I am looking for that clear separation from the dirty trays that come in and making sure then they go through that cycle and then going on to a clean area. I'm looking at the wash or the dishwasher. If it's a high temperature, if it's uh, reaching the appropriate heat, if it's the low temperature chemical indicators, what I look for is making sure that it's being evaluated every meal cycle and that it's being recorded on a log and that that log is easily accessible. Um, this is the only way that you can really ensure that your, your washing, your dishwasher is working appropriately every single meal service and that it's sanitizing the, the dishware that's going to be going throughout the facility. So ensuring that it is being checked every meal service and then being recorded. In addition, I like to identify how often the carts are being cleaned. They should be cleaned, disinfected every single meal service as well. Now, I believe it's in Minnesota, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you guys have these fabulous cart washes, and I don't know if it was the the um, architects of these buildings at the time, but I wish we had them across the country. We do not. Um, typically, we have to take our carts outside and hose them down, but you you guys have had these great cart washes where you can spray them and then everything is cleaned and sanitized right there. And this is great because then we really know that it's being done every meal service. Next slide. Um, again, we just want to make sure that this is what we just talked about, making sure that the dishwashers are checked and that there is a, a clean process or a process for cleaning, disinfecting the carts. Next slide. Um, sorry, Tracy, I'll have you go back one more slide. Um, so one more thing about the food services as well is I look, I'll also look at the, uh, I'll go into the walk-in coolers, the, the, um, where the produce and the freezer um, coolers are, and just ensuring that you have the proper distance from the top. It's 18 inches. You don't want to have any boxes that are higher uh, or are over closer to the ceiling than 18 inches, because this will prevent proper air circulation and flow throughout that walk-in cooler, as well as we do not want to store any boxes on the floor. Um, I always make a joke saying, you know, I know that the food is delivered always on the days I come in because the boxes are on the floor, but um, just make sure that the food is put away quickly and that the boxes do not remain on the floor. And also checking the temperatures on those uh, every day as well, making sure that they're meeting the right temperatures. Also in food services, just, just meeting with your supervisors, again, making sure that like the ice machines, if you have ice machines in there, how frequently they're actually maintained, um, making sure that you have the, the handle to the ice machine is not stored in the ice, that it's completely emptied on a schedule, typically monthly and clean and sanitized. Um, and so those are some of the things that I look for in food services, also making sure people are wearing a hairnet, um, and, and keeping that environment sanitary. And from there, uh, I don't know, Tracy, did you want to go from there? Yes, so I, I will. Okay, great. Thank you, Buffy. That was a great presentation. So for those of you who are not familiar with Superior Health Quality Alliance, we are a quality improvement organization, and we have been helping many nursing homes across Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, um, who CMS has identified as potentially needing some technical assistance with infection prevention and control. Um, most recently, in the last several months, we have focused our attention to helping support those nursing homes who are identified 
by CMS as a hot spot or a super hot spot. And those nursing homes have qualified uh, for a free on-site consultation with Dr. Buffy. Um, we were doing on-site, but with fewer homes involved, we are starting to do these virtually, uh, which have worked out very well. But if you do, and if you think maybe you do qualify, um, certainly you can reach out to myself, Buffy, or um, Superior Health directly um, to find out. If you don't qualify, uh, we have information here. Here's uh, Dr. Buffy's email. And then um, here is her contact information if you would like to set up an on site visit. So with that, I will open it up. Um, I've been checking in the chat and it looks like we do have some questions. You have a letter to read from one of our nursing homes, Greg. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. yes. So um, one of our homes here in Minnesota who had a on-site visit with Buffy um, was so thoughtful, um, and appreciative of the information she received and she wanted to share this with everyone. So she writes, we found the infection control on-site visit extremely helpful to our home. While we had increased our infection control standard, it was eye-opening to see areas we were lacking. Taking the time to visit each department in the home really emphasized the importance of infection control in all areas and training that was needed. One of the things Buffy did that was impressive was to have a housekeeper actually demonstrate how to clean a resident's room. That way, she was guiding the employee and the employee was able to learn with hands-on experience the proper way to clean. It was a very helpful teaching moment Buffy also spoke with a vendor on site and addressed some issues with them, i.e. temperatures, reaching a certain temperature in the washing machines. And this was an added bonus and help for, for helpful for laundry employees. The photos that were taken let us see these areas we were lacking as well as areas we were managing correctly. Um, and there, you know, picture speaks a thousand words. So this was extremely helpful to, to them and other homes. And the comprehensive guide she put together for our home has really been an asset for other staff members to follow and be included in their results. So on an end note, Buffy let us know that in many areas we were exceeding the standards. After months of developing policies, following guidance for COVID infections, moving residents to other floors to develop a COVID unit, getting testing underway, and doing our very best to keep all residents and staff safe. It was very nice to hear positive feedback. We feel fortunate to have had this time with Buffy and would recommend her expertise and education again in the future and hope other homes can have this same educational experience in fighting infections in congregate settings. So thank you for the opportunity to share in this experience. We wish Buffy good luck in her future. And that was from Lynn Kerber. So I, let's see, there was one question I wanna get in here and find it. Someone, uh, looks like Amy asked, what was the EVS course that you took? Yeah, thanks, Tracy. I went ahead and posted it while you were reading that. I looked it up really quick. Uh, and, and it's the um, Certificate of Non-Acute uh, Cleaning Training Course. And so I provided the link there for you. Um, and you're able to um, take that course as well. So it's, there's more environmental services stuff that you had no idea. So it was really <laughs> informative. Yes. Um, and it says, Dorothy, I received info that the face shield does not need 
well, does not need cleaning between residents as long as it is not touched. I was told this was per the federal surveyors. Is this not the case? Yes, yeah, so great, great question. And I, I see your comment about conflicting info, which I totally empathize with. This has been the biggest challenge with throughout this whole pandemic is the conflicting information from the state and the federal um, federal requirements. So the CDC guidance on eye cleaning eye protection, if you're reusing it, is actually states that if um, anytime that it is removed, you are correct, and or if it becomes soiled. So the you just want to make sure that within your um, state health department that they're abiding by this, because I know in many areas that they, if you are leaving the actual, um, if you're leaving the the resident room, then they want that on quarantine that they want it um, cleaned as well. So it, it is worth checking and ensuring what your state is requiring. Um, if, if anything, if you have the information from CDC then to back it up, then that's important too. And that's kind of what I follow as well, um, because it, if you're constantly taking it off and touching it, it could be even a potential risk too. So this is really a hard area for me as well as many people, um, just because it's, it's, there's just no good solution for it really. So just make sure you're following what your state and county recommend. And then also um, there've been a couple questions related to the webinar, whether this is Recorded, and yes, it has been recorded, and uh, we can certainly make the slides available. I realize that that is, I love the idea of sharing um, this information with your environmental services staff, dietary, laundry, um, and anyone else. Sometimes uh, maintenance can also benefit for, from seeing this information. So, um, uh, Elaine, if you would like to post the evaluate link to the evaluation in the chat I, for everyone, I also would like you to um, maybe let them know when this uh, webinar might be available or posted. I think typically our webinars are posted about a week after um, at the most. So typically it only takes about a week for us to get this back on our Superior Health QIO YouTube page. And Tracy, one thing I just posted in the chat, one of the recommendations I always provide to facilities is to check out some training videos from the Oregon Patient Safety Com Commission. There were some great training videos that were um, developed in 2016 with e Ebola funding. And it really, they're, they're cartoons, they're engaging, they're animated. I say I'm a kid at heart, so I guess they, they entertain me and teach me at the same time. But there's three for housekeeping, two for laundry, and two for food services. They're about eight to 10 minutes long. They're in English and Spanish. And I definitely recommend having staff watch those training videos because they're just, like I said, they're easy to understand. They're not an hour long and they really do take you through some of the basics of infection control. Great. I also want to open it up for anyone that wants to ask a question. Certainly you can, um, if you're if you are connected through your computer, you can just simply unmute um, by hovering at the bottom left corner of the Zoom screen. If you are calling in by phone, uh, press star six and that will unmute your phone. So we would love to hear your questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> 
Well, if we have no other questions, um, did you, any last words, Buffy, before we close? Sure, thanks, Tracy. So just as we we continue to navigate through this pandemic, I just want to encourage everyone, you know, that we've come a long ways. I definitely am seeing less and less COVID in the facilities um, due to the vaccination. So they are definitely our tool to helping our facilities. And, you know, the, the information presented today as is some of it and most of it was COVID related, keeping in mind that the basic infection control practices such as for laundry and housekeeping, uh, food services, transmission-based precautions, hand hygiene, those are going to, those are key to implementing a, an effective infection control program. And so you want to continue to practice these to reinforce the program you already have. Um, as we continue to navigate, not only through this pandemic, but after we, we have a lot of work to do in our healthcare settings. We have multi-drug resistant organisms and um, we have C. diff and, and many other infections that continue to create a lot of harm. And by implementing these basic infection control practices, we're able to reduce the risk of harm, not only to our residents, but our, our precious healthcare staff. And so I just wanna encourage you to continue um, to, to not let up on your good infection control practices, even as we navigate through this and, and into the future. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you, Dr. Buffy. And with that, we will close. Thank you all for joining us today.